welcome seekers of hidden knowledge to the mystical realm of the occult. Delve into the secrets of the universe as we journey together into the enigmatic world of ancient wisdom. Brought to you by your guide through the shadows of enlightenment, wisdom rocker. Uncover the mysteries, unlock the power, and journey with us as we explore the hidden depths within the pages of forgotten scrolls and ancient texts. Prepare to embark on a journey beyond the ordinary, where wisdom transcends time and knowledge is your greatest ally. Welcome to Wisdom Rocker. Prepare to awaken your inner sage. In this video, we will be uncovering the wisdom within the chapters of Lectures on Ancient Philosophy Written by Manley P. Hall Chapter 15 Symbolism, the Universal Language A symbol is a form designed to portray some abstract quality. A symbol must convey an impression, it must cause the mind to see something which, though not actually in the symbol itself, is suggested by the symbol. Through the familiar is thus, shadowed forth the unfamiliar, through the commonplace that which is not commonplace is made evident. Symbols are forms, but the principles for which they stand so transcend the boundaries of form that they can only be sensed by reading into the symbol certain abstract elements or by grasping with internal comprehension that greater profundity which the symbol does not contain but whose existence it intimates. Symbols are also employed to epitomize. A whole universe may be summarized in a single star and vast issues by being reduced to their simple elements may be rendered intelligible. By clothing the unfamiliar in terms of the familiar the mind is enabled to grasp with a certain measure of accuracy the significance of the unknown. We must re-emphasize the point stressed in our opening chapter, namely, that as symbols increase in complexity they decrease in power. Thus, the simple figures set forth immensities, the compound figures parvitudes. Increasing definition causes qualities to verge toward form, hence the more intricate the figure the more it is concerned with particulars and the narrower becomes the scope of its symbolism. One of the true purposes of symbols is to preserve ideas in an indefinite state so that their lucidity shall not be obscured by unnecessary form involvement. Between symbolism and caricature there is a slight fundamental difference. As a personality may often be most truthfully depicted by the exaggeration of certain characteristics, so symbols may convey an adequate likeness of a quality and still in no appreciable way resemble the quality. In the last analysis, man is not simply a body but rather a bundle of characteristics which confer upon his objective nature a certain temperament or individuality. By deftly accentuating the idiosyncrasies of character with a few heartless lines, the caricaturist exposes the deformities of rationality and thus, portrays the man as he really is. The art of caricature follows certain cardinal principles in recognition of the impressions innate in forms and orders. Breadth, for example, is always associated with optimism, length with pessimism. Hence to broaden the head gives the impression of mental sufficiency, or broad-mindedness, to broaden the body suggests a certain substantiality. To narrow the head causes the impression of intolerance or narrowness of outlook, to lengthen the body oppresses the mind with a feeling of melancholy. Angles convey the impression of strength, curves of beauty, harmonious combination of angles and curves invoke concord inharmonious combinations produce discord. Definite reactions are thus, produced by simple lines or combinations of lines. Colors and sounds also possess similar powers of mental and emotional stimulation. Consciously or unconsciously, the shape and arrangement of bodies with which we come in close contact thus, profoundly influence our dispositions. Definite mental reactions are caused by contemplation of the symmetrical Pythagorean solids, for all natural bodies contain a force generated by their own organization which leaves its subtle record on the inner sensibilities of man. 
By accentuating this force according to a definite procedure certain mental attitude can be stimulated and in recognition of this principle the mysteries recommend that their initiates meditate upon certain emblems or figures prepared with this end in view. In common with the laws of caricature, symbolism secures emphasis by distortion, harmony by conventionalization and force by simplicity. In great measure, art is the process of elimination. Symbolism reveals the necessary by eliminating the unnecessary and emphasizes the real by disregarding the superficial which obscures the real. In this respect symbolism verges toward the diagrammatic, for through diagrams processes are made evident. Phenomenon when stripped of its outer part reveals the laws by which it exists and manifests. Being chiefly concerned with those few primary principles which are the basis of infinite diversity, philosophy finds in symbolism not only a language singularly qualified to disseminate fundamental premises, but a method whereby universal ideas are communicated without passing them through the sphere of particulars. Symbolism thus, embodies most fully the requisites of the perfect medium of education. Every symbol is a definite stimulus to the mind and has the delightful faculty of reflecting the moods of the mind attempting to analyze its parts. In other words, a symbol always means what we think it means. Dealing with incorporeal substance, it takes on, chameleon-like, the interpretive attitudes of its interpreter. Through the symbols the individual thus discovers not what symbols mean but rather what he knows himself. In the effort to understand what the first symbolist concealed under his figures, the resources of the mind are stimulated to reveal their own fecundity. Thus, emblematic figures and fables draw out from the individual analyzing them the sum and substance of his own understanding. By studying symbols men learn about themselves, for they read into the figures their own hopes and aspirations, their own concepts of universal order and their own understanding of divine agency. To some degree is thus, explained the diversity of codes by which the affairs of men are regulated. Life itself is a symbol and each must interpret it according to the convictions of his own soul. As we look about we see a universe which, whether we know it or not, is simply our inner convictions reflected back to us from the polished surface of nature. In Lazarus laughed, Eugene O'Neill causes his hero to thus, taunt Gaius Caligula, the heir of Tiberius Caesar, but what do you matter, O oh deathly important one? Put yourself that question as a jester. Are you a speck of dust danced in the wind? Then laugh, dancing. Laugh yes to your insignificance I thereby will be born your new greatness. Tragic is the plight of the tragedian whose only audience is himself. Life is for each man a solitary cell whose walls are mirrors. Terrified is Caligula by the faces he makes. But I tell you to laugh in the mirror, that seeing your life gay, you may begin to live as a guest and not as a condemned one. The non-philosophic suffer from a disease which may best be termed superficiality, man's thinking ever fails because of its shallowness. He often mistakes breadth for depth, believing that with but a hasty scrutiny he can become familiar with any object. Superficiality generally springs from indifference and necessarily produces mediocrity. Our interests ever lie with the familiar and for the unfamiliar we have no emotion save indifference. By stimulating interest, philosophy causes man to regard an ever-widening circle of incident as a proper field for his speculation. Thus, the man, formerly oblivious to the wonders of the universe about him, suddenly comes to realize their existence and with growing enthusiasm applies himself to the garnering of knowledge. The study of symbolism causes the mind to develop what may be defined as philosophic suspicion. Instead of accepting things at their face value, the symbolist searches for their hidden motives, those invisible agencies which are the animate causes of apparently inanimate objects. When the mind comes instinctively to regard forms as the outer garments of realities, 
great strides have been taken in the rationalization of the entire nature. Man begins to know as soon as he divests himself of the illusion that the universe is material and matter the divine reality. From this realization it is but a step to the comprehension that truth does not exist in matter but must be sought for behind the veil of matter. The physical, or irrational, mind is incapable of comprehending a single absolute fact, for abiding in the sphere of relative conclusions it necessarily lacks the accuracy of exact procedure. Symbolism discloses the relationship of an intangible agent to its tangible subject. It renders conceivable that interval between the invisible, which is the fact, and the visible, which is the fancy. Even a photograph is fanciful and misleading when compared to a cleverly drawn caricature, for while the caricature may but slightly resemble the physical appearance it is still more discerning than the camera's eye. Our physical personalities thus, reveal us as we seem to be, but our intangible individualities continually reveal us as we are. Unfortunately for others, but comfortable for ourselves, the number able to read the intangible characteristics are few, otherwise our mortification would overwhelm us. Yet, in reality, our truest friend is the one who points out to us that which it is so difficult for us to estimate for ourselves, namely, the quality and compatibility of our intangible parts. Symbolism should be employed throughout the process of education, for by it two definite ends are attainable. First, the student will instinctively reveal to the teacher the constitution of his reasoning part by the interpretation he places upon the symbols, second, the student will be stimulated to originality and thereby preserve the peculiar technique of his own rational processes. The death of originality is the death of genius. Symbolism encourages originality and hence is productive of genius. Symbols can be devised to induce almost any desired phase of thought or emotion. By the use of emblematic figures alone, abnormality can be corrected and subnormality raised to a normal state. Paracelsus discovered that words written upon parchment when held up before animals produce as definite results as though the words were spoken although it is evident that the animal cannot read. Combinations of letters, magical symbols and curious figures, radiate definite impressions and from the realization of this fact must ultimately emerge a new form of corrective therapy in which the medicine will be administered through the channel of sight. The eyes are peculiarly responsive and the process of visualization already borders upon the psychic, for the impressions transmitted by the eyes to the brain are exceedingly subtle and powerful beyond imagination. The reactions set up through the sight of definite forms or patterns have not yet been thoroughly catalogued. When this work is finished we will understand far more intelligently the motives producing joy and sorrow, sickness and health, vice and virtue. The environment contacted by the individual through the medium of the eyes molds him profoundly and even his status in the world itself is a key to the temperaments that surge within his breast. In his general introduction to psychoanalysis, Freud attempts to relate certain primitive motives of the soul with dreams, in this way disclosing a subconscious faculty of association in the human mind by which external objects, through either appearance or use, become media for the expression of psychic impulses. Freud is dealing with what Plato would call the animal soul, that part of the psychic nature which has assumed the idea of generation and which constitutes the ceaseless urge toward the establishment of forms. Obsessed with the idea of polarity, the generating soul causes to flow from itself those impulses which Freud analyzes under the general subject of sex psychology. He maintains that the peculiar soul power which manifests while the functioning organism is asleep is concerned primarily with the principles of generation and the sleep symbols are largely of a phallic nature. This is incontestable evidence that the earliest religions of mankind were priapic cults and based upon the generating urge of the soul. Clothing itself in appropriate forms, this impulse resulted in strange fables and figures which are now almost dissociated from the primary impulses that inspired them. Though having but few interests, 
the animal soul often employs a diversity of symbols to signify its attitudes. Thousands of emblems and figures are used to represent a single idea. The animal soul is interested in neither religion nor philosophy and our mental concepts are its playthings. The animal soul is primarily concerned with the laws of attraction and reproduction, its duty is to perpetuate the species and it knows no ethics beyond this limited field. Freud infers that dream symbols can be reduced to a very simple alphabet of symbolism. Clothing its urges in the familiar, the soul creates its alphabet during physical infancy and childhood and retains it throughout life. As humanity thus, preserves in its religion and philosophy the simple elements which dominated its attitudes during the most primitive periods, so the adult man or woman clothes these soul impulses in those figures and similes which were impressed upon the outer nature during adolescence. It is comparatively easy to understand how most symbols come to have a phallic import. All forms are generations and all generations are emblematic of the processes by which they themselves came into being. To the individual who functions in the animal nature, that is, where the rational soul has not disengaged itself from the involvements of the corporeal senses, there is no sphere of interpretation above that of generation. To those who by the disciplines and procedures of the higher life have transmuted or regenerated their inferior natures, a loftier sphere of interpretation is rendered apprehensible. Transcending the idea of generation, the philosopher discovers in the symbol a meaning more exalted than that concerned with reproductive processes. Not only is there the animal soul which clings tenaciously to form, but there is also the divine, rational soul which verges ever toward reality. Above that part which conceives generation to be the supreme function there is that which contemplates the deathlessness and permanence of the supreme good, realizing that divinity is ungenerated and transcends in every respect the limitations of mortal procedure. Symbols consequently change their meanings according to the level of intelligence upon which their interpreter functions. The purpose of symbols is to uncover the limitations of mortal consciousness by continually emphasizing the insufficiency of the interpretations placed upon them. Confronted by a symbol, every man recognizes the uncertainties of his own nature. Being never sure that he is correct in his interpretation he is made to realize his heritage in that common uncertainty shared by all ages and all men. The insufficiency of modern so-called knowledge is evident the moment the mind is invited to reflect upon problems involving certitudes. Thus, faced, the intellect hesitates and becomes confused. Our thinking is sufficient until it becomes necessary to trust ourselves to its mercy, when it retires abashed, informing us unmistakably of its incapacity. The paradox of knowledge is that knowledge does not exist, for we claim already that for which in reality we are searching. Modern knowledge is not a discovery of facts but the effort to discover facts and there are great moments when the truth of this apparent contradiction is brought home to us. There is a popular fallacy that we grow by change, like the ironic method described and employed by Socrates, change is inseparable from the elements of pain and sorrow. We advance but slowly when every new discovery must contradict those gone before, when every new philosopher must give the lie to his predecessors and every new order depends for its success upon the destruction of previous orders. A little apple tree does not change into a lemon tree while in the process of becoming a big apple tree, nor does truth change its identity in the process of being understood. Every great mind evolves by a sequential process. It does not tear down previous conclusions to make room for new. A growing tree increases from a single shoot to a miracle of branches and foliage, yet nowhere is there any inconsistency or contradiction in the process. The trunk is not destroyed that a new branch may come forth, nor is the tree uprooted to make room for its own fruit. Each manifestation depends upon that which preceded it and in turn finds its consummation in that which issues from it. 
From the first quickening of its seed the tree moves inevitably toward a single end. At every step of the way its procedures complement each other and unite in the realization of that end. This perfect cooperation of parts results not only in the tree maintaining its homogeneity and attaining its end with the least expenditure of energy and time, but demonstrates the exactness of the power that willed it into being. Never will the world think well until men reason as trees grow, causing to issue from the single trunk of rational certainty the foliage of thoughts which, clustered symmetrically about their center, impart grace and dignity to the whole. In their ignorance men make laws, only later to find them faulty. Then, lest their infractions of these laws seem too flagrant, they amend their former errors with fresh errors in the effort to render their own conceits endurable. The various schisms in the body of religion seek to mollify their differences by resorting to condescension or modification. Their compromises, however, are a glaring confession that neither possesses enough of fact to ensure survival. So age after age man, who according to the pagan astrologers was fashioned under the influences of cancer, still demonstrates his kinship to the crab by making most of his progress in a backward fashion. It is more than a seven days wonder that institutions of importance have to be saved from extinction by periodic renovation, or have their authority curbed lest their intolerance overshadow and endanger personal or national liberties. Philosophy declares that the first step in the development of rational powers is to establish them upon an immovable foundation, so that the mind in its unfoldment will not be forced periodically to overthrow previous attitudes, but continually to supplement and justify them. To realize this ideal it is necessary that the first postulations of the intellect shall be vast enough or sufficient in scope so that DL subsequent thinking will not be forced to exceed the boundaries of these first assumptions. Men waste a lifetime devising new methods of thought, only to realize at the end that they have outgrown their own premises, that their building is top-heavy and that in the architectonics of intellect their edifice of theories is grotesque and inharmonious. As all the agencies of the tree conspire to consummate its purpose, namely, fruitage, so all the agencies of thought conspire to produce the fruitage of the mind. Lacking the wisdom of the tree man all too often finds his roots and trunk structurally too insecure to bear the weight of the ripening fruit. The eclectic spirit prevalent in this century is largely responsible for this condition. Men do not think their thoughts through. Viewing a fractional part of an idea, they are content with its apparent consistency, failing to realize that it may have no place at all in that greater picture composed of infinite ideas combined in most complex patterns. We do not apply Immanuel Kant's critique by which he measured the justifiableness of assumptions. We might ask ourselves, if the whole universe were run by the same principles as my own little notions, would the world still be sufficient to meet the needs of the vast order which it maintains, if my little whim were elevated to the dignity of a divine reality, would it serve all men, if my thoughts were laws, would there be justice in creation? These are the questions which intrude their presence upon the mind seeking to think things through, often to their bitter end. It is not sufficient that an idea should tickle our sensibilities or give us a pleasant emotional thrill. It is necessary that the idea should stand the acid test of analysis. It must survive the heartless process of thinking through. We say heartless for few notions except that they proceed from rationalities so noble that notions have become permissible to them, can survive even the first stages of analysis. Symbolism re-emphasizes the necessity of approaching every issue with an adequate philosophic background. Confront the untrained mind with some symbol or fable and it will construct a confused and meaningless explanation, usually far more complex than the figure warrants and as senseless as a macuz chatter. Few of us have had the success of Samuel Johnson in protecting the intellect against the assaults of words. In the preface to his dictionary, he writes I am not yet so lost in lexicography, as to forget that words are the daughters of the earth and that things are the sons of heaven. 
The superficial thinker reasons in terms of words alone, the profound thinker so venerates the meaning of words that he conserves his language. We must all realize that it is beyond man's province to comprehend one-third of what he says and sacrilegious to talk much with little understanding. Whereas the mediocre intellect is capable of ministering to physical needs, it is decreed that in the more exalted realms of rationality the mediocre shall pass into the oblivion of the disqualified. Man can never hope to escape the limitations of his own irrationality, whenever he attempts to transcend himself, his insufficiency blocks his way. The struggle must ever be to overcome insufficiency, to establish within the self an intellectual adequacy in which the mind acquires a competency for its problems. Symbolism stimulates the healthy mind that has been introduced to the disciplines of philosophy but bewilders the unorganized thinker. No mind is really sufficient for its own needs until it has learned to act as a connective tissue between ideas. Isolated thoughts are comparatively valueless, for the probability of error is too imminent. An impractical thought, then, is one that can survive only in an isolated state, a practical thought one that survives repeated contact with competitive ideas. To study symbols is dangerous for the immature mind, for the practice will only compound absurdities and establish more firmly irrational habits of thought. Hence the ancient mysteries circulated among the masses definite interpretations of their symbols and allegories, encouraging the untrained thinker to accept these expositions and wonder no more on the subject. Had this not been done a wild orgy of misinterpretation would have followed and erroneous speculations without number would have found lodgment in minds incapable of recognizing and protecting themselves against these incongruities. Thus. In symbolism the profound investigator will discover that the real is ever concealed beneath the superficial. He who is contented with the superficial will consequently never discover the real and so from age to age the arcana of ancient philosophy have been preserved inviolate at the hands of the unprepared. These secrets are their own custodians, revealing themselves only to such as refuse to accept any substitute for truth, or any part of knowledge less than all. Two oft-repeated questions are, why is it so easy to deceive people in matters pertaining to religion or philosophy and why are the best educated the most gullible? The answer to the first is self-evident. Theology and philosophy are sciences dealing with intangibles. There is no criterion by which their integrity can be questioned or established save that of a rational mind qualified by its own integrity to weigh and pass judgment upon the elements involved. These divine sciences so completely transcend the limitations of the sense perceptions by which mortal concerns are estimated that every code of physical integrity is inapplicable to them. There is nothing tangible and evident with which to associate these abstruse verities and the investigator must appoint himself their inquisitor. As all life's great realities exist in this intangible sphere, which we like to term the invisible or causal universe, the problems of existence can never be actually solved except by the exploring faculties of a rationalized intellect. The second question is based upon the unfortunate fact that education, while in some instances increasing the tolerant attitude, all too often fails to increase the integrity so that it can properly direct tolerance. The educated man is usually one who has been instructed in the enormity of his own ignorance and is therefore, inclined to believe that anything may be true. On the other hand, the uneducated man is generally very set in his opinions and hence difficult to convince even of demonstrable facts. A scientist is frequently a disillusioned man. He has been undeceived as to the sufficiency of knowledge and is correspondingly gullible. Camille Flammarion declared that there was but one attitude of the mind more dangerous than that which accepted everything, namely, the attitude that accepted nothing. The materialist who understands practically nothing believes practically nothing. The ignorant must ultimately become his own executioner. Thus, the struggle for knowledge becomes identical with the struggle for survival, 
for only knowledge ensures survival. We are as permanent as the realities that have come to be established in our own natures, we are as impermanent as the fancies that incline us one way or another, only to eventually leave us as ignorant as before. The rational faculties are man's sole hope of ultimate accomplishment and this accomplishment is identical with happiness, for the changes necessary to establish harmonious physical relationships must first descend from the rational sphere and come into physical manifestation through minds specially trained in philosophic procedure. Every child that is born is a potential instrument for the salvation of the world and remains an unknown but all-powerful quantity until our physical cultural processes destroy those sensitive instruments of erudition by which the imperceptible verities of the rational sphere can be sensed. Humanity's most precious assets are those developing physical brains, which as focal centers of mental energy radiate thought throughout the substances of the inferior sphere. The answer to every problem, therefore, must be considered as existing in the rational sphere, awaiting that day when unfolding human brains shall be so disciplined in the procedures of rational thought as to become adequate vehicles for the manifestation of this superior knowledge in the physical world. Rendered prophetic by the luminosity of their inner natures, the sages of antiquity discoursed with rare acumen upon the fate of the sacred sciences at the hands of generations then unborn. In the Asclepian dialogue is preserved a prophetic picture of the decadence of knowledge in baser ages to come. In those days no one shall look up to heaven. The religious man shall be accounted insane, the irreligious shall be thought wise, the furious brave and the worst of men shall be considered a good man. For the soul and all things about it, by which it is either naturally immortal, or conceives that it shall attain to immortality, conformably to what I have explained to you, shall not only be the subject of laughter, but shall be considered as vanity. Believe me, likewise, that a capital punishment shall be appointed for him who applies himself to the religion of intellect. New statutes and new laws shall be established and nothing religious, or which is worthy of heaven or celestial concerns, shall be heard, or believed by the mind. There will be a lamentable departure of the gods from men, noxious angels will alone remain, who, being mingled with human nature, will violently impel the miserable men, of that time, to war, to rapine, to fraud and to everything contrary to the nature of the soul. Much of this prophecy has already been verified, for during the Dark Ages capital punishment was meted out to those who dared apply themselves to the religion of intellect. Philosophy was swept from the face of Christendom and the voices of the gods were drowned out by the hymns of the martyrs. Fleeing before theological fanaticism, the custodians of the Arcana Imperii took refuge in the Arabian desert finding Islam more receptive to philosophic instruction. Accepting Greek philosophy as a sacred trust, the sons of the Prophet, when carried into southern Europe on the high tides of their fortunes, established in Spain universities far excelling contemporary Christian institutions of learning. To the colleges of the Moors came scholars from every part of Europe and the lips of men again taught the inspired doctrines of Plato and Aristotle. Islam realized that the teachings of Plato and his illustrious disciple assisted man to liberate his soul from the entanglements of idolatry, for the four caliphs had set for themselves the task of exterminating idolatry from the earth. Proclus declares that the philosophy of Plato was given to men for the benefit of their terrestrial souls, that philosophy might be authority instead of statutes, rationality instead of temples, understanding instead of sacred institutions, truth instead of mortal leaders of salvation, that the men who are now, as well as those who shall exist hereafter, might not wander about the earth destitute of intelligence. The literalist is an inveterate profaner of the beautiful. His attitude is a supreme blasphemy, for his art is to limit all natures to the narrow confines of form. He sees nothing beyond an appearance, mistaking the outward show for the inner quality and the dimensional as the only certainty. Whereas the idealist ever strives to elevate man to the estate of gods, 
the literalist would drag the immortals from their Olympian heights and debase them with the similitude of man. The literalist emphasizes inconsequentials, to him every jot and tittle is a fetish. To the literalist, symbolism is inscrutable, for he is incapable of distinguishing between principle as an abstract reality and form as the transitory vehicle of that principle. Religious stagnation is the wayward child of literalism. As long as theology clings to the blasphemous idea that to think is to usurp a divine prerogative, theologians are restrained from reasoning on the logic of the law and only the saints are accredited with sufficient sanctity to contemplate the sandal thongs of the Lord. Quaking under their cowls, the pious clergy read and reread the ominous lines from Revelation wherein it is written. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Little wonder that the divine science of interpretation failed amid such hostile environment, that symbols became fearful images of literal terrors and the gods came to have as many hairs in their beards as some inspired artisan might carve into their Carrara features. Maimonides, the most learned of the rabbins, who devoted a lifetime to contemplation of the scriptures, writes thus, Of its hidden meanings and secret imports, we should not take literally that which is written in the book of the creation, Genesis, nor entertain the same concepts of it as are common with the vulgar. If it were, otherwise, our learned ancient sages would not have taken so much pains to conceal the sense and to keep before the eyes of the uninstructed the veil of allegory which conceals the truths which it contains. Taken literally, the work contains the most extravagant and absurd ideas of the deity. Whoever can guess at the true meaning should take care not to divulge it. This is a maxim inculcated by our wise men, especially in connection with the work of the six days. It is possible that by our own intelligence, or by the aid of others, some may guess the true meaning, in which case they should be silent respecting it, or, if they do speak of it, they should do so obscurely, as I myself do, leaving the rest to be guessed at by those who have sufficient ability to understand me. While the literalist may believe he is defending the integrity of the gods, he is actually detracting from their magnificence by presuming them to be speakers of words when in reality they are disseminators of ideas. Origen asks, What man of good sense will ever persuade himself that there has been a first, a second, and a third day and that these days have each of them had their morning and their evening, when there was as yet neither sun, nor moon, nor stars? Even the great Saint Augustine admitted the scriptures to possess profound and unsuspected meanings, at the same time maintaining with characteristic inconsistency that both their literal and historical accuracy also should be affirmed. We shall yet realize that man cannot live by history alone, even though that history be declared sacrosanct. To studious Christian and pagan alike, Symbolism becomes a philosophic stone whereby literal absurdities are transmuted into allegorical realities. While little minds may thus, thread their way through religion, those of greater vision recognizing in symbolism a golden key to the treasure house of the world's thought studiously apply themselves to the principles according to which all fables, allegories and emblematic figures are erected. Another phase of symbolism presents itself for consideration. The literalities of one generation become the allegories of the next. The changing customs, the periodic redirectionalizing of interest and the reinterpretation of the meanings of words and figures, make it most difficult for any generation to understand its forebears. Hence to interpret the ideals of one century in the terms of another is to lose a certain intangible atmosphere which cannot survive the vicissitudes of time. Consequently, to secure an accurate translation of Greek philosophic writing does not necessarily imply that we possess the information embodied in those writings. It has been said that no philosophy can survive translation, for no sacred teaching can ever be actually understood except by one able to transport himself into the locale and time in which the material was originally in detail. Hence arose the practice of perpetuating the inner doctrines through oral tradition, 
for it was presumed that each generation would reclothe these basic ideas with proper vestments and thus, preserve them free from distortion at the hands of time. To understand the mysteries we must cease to live in America of the twentieth century and assume the temperaments, attitudes, interests and environments in which the mysteries were first established. To understand Greek philosophy we must understand ancient Greece and its people. The secret teachings are always clothed in the terms of the familiar when revealed to the multitudes and the familiar terms of yesterday are not the familiar terms of today. The same is true of the Bible. The archaic Hebrew of the pre-Christian period interpreted the ideals of an older people of whom not one true vestige now remains. The Pentateuch is the living remnant of a world long dead, of interests which have outlived their time, of attitudes archaic and ethics extinct. If we would release the spirit of beauty locked within the ancient characters and make it serve this generation, we must divest it of its ancient robes and reclothe it in the familiar habiliments of today. With rare discrimination we must separate the principle from its form, the living from the dead, the eternal from the temporal. Only the symbolist has developed that fine faculty of dividing the relevant from the irrelevant and prudently preserving that which is usable. As the archaeologist sifting the ashes of dead civilization recovers therefrom priceless evidence of things no longer evident, so the symbolist studiously examining the intellectual remains of vanished orders rescues from oblivion those fragments of rationality which will contribute to the right thinking of the world. As the earth is built up of geologic strata, the rot of millenniums so the body of world thought is composed of an infinite number of layers, in each of which may be seen the half-disintegrated remains of vast institutions and noble intellectual procedures. In things of the mind the past has not lived in vain. Those who live best today live by the world's first thoughts and the foolish of today still commit the same grave errors that the first philosophers decried. There is no such thing as modernism in human thought, for minds have labored since the beginning and the world's first thinker reasoned out the same problems which the world's last sage must ponder. The future will perpetuate the quest of the past and tomorrow is but the knowledge of today plus an added period for contemplation. A few simple rules will be of value to those desirous of assuming the mantle of philosophy. There are many queer pockets in its ancient folds and only when they are investigated in order will their contents prove of highest value. It has well been said that there are tricks in every trade. These tricks are a certain knowing how by which accomplishment is facilitated. In accordance with the ancient Pythagorean law it is first necessary to establish the triangle before the solution of any problem is possible. The science of symbolism is accordingly based upon a threefold premise. Once the mind is familiarized with this triangular foundation, integrity and industry will discover the correct solution. First, every substance, object, element and argent in the universe is capable of instructing man in those phases of divine order which are involved in its own constitution. In other words, Everything can teach us of itself and as all natures differ from each other to greater or lesser degree, each performs a definite ministry of instruction. From an earnest consideration of their constitutions and procedures man is enabled to familiarize himself with those laws of being to which he himself is also subject. Second, the more fully an individual is acquainted with the operations of the inferior universe, the better qualified he is to contemplate the constitution of the causal spheres. This is a development of the hermetic axiom of analogy, namely, that the above is like the below and the below like the above. The knowledge of inferiors is necessary to the knowledge of superiors. The danger arising, however, from the analysis of inferiors is that the mind may form an attachment for them and thus, be rendered incapable of turning from them to the consideration of superiors. Third, all natures should be regarded as worthy of profound analysis, for the deadly enemy of all proficiency is a superficial attitude toward any phase of existence. The true source of man's education is not to be found in books, 
but lies in his observation of natural phenomena and his attempt to estimate its significance. Failure to regard any object as worthy of particular attention is to lose the opportunity to understand the superphysical function or characteristic which is the intangible but all-powerful cause of the object itself. Symbolism, when thus, regarded, is elevated to the dignity of a religion, or more correctly, it becomes the means to the end of religion. To the philosophic atheist symbolism occupies the middle ground between knowledge and ignorance, becoming the divine instructor through whom the mysteries of the inner spheres are made apparent to the outer sense perceptions. Thus, instead of waiting for the heavens to open and permit an angelic visitant to deliver homilies from an ombo supported by some cumulus cloud, the symbolist liberates through rational procedure the ideas resident in form. These ideas thus, freed preach their own silent but all-informative sermons. To the one capable of discerning God, deity is omnipresent in his own handiworks. The philosopher is the continual recipient of divine revelation and the gods are proximate indeed to that illumined sage who sees God in the fire and hears him in the wind. The Phrygian dactyls, physicians by magic, employed symbols because of the remarkable therapeutic powers they possessed. The figures drawn upon parchment and papyrus, or carved into the forms of medallions and talismans, were applied to the diseased members or attached to the persons of the sick and thus, by necromantic means dislodged the evil agencies conspiring to drive the spirit from its infected nature. Paracelsus, who secured from the Arabians many secrets of pagan theurgy, describes in detail the remedial agencies reposing in the ancient metals and their alloys, particularly electrum. Of the virtues of electrum, which he declared to be composed of the seven planetary metals, the great Swiss physician writes, vessels fashioned from electrum render their contents safe from poison and from sorcery, for this alloy has great sympathy for the human race. The ancients fashioned from this mystical substance rings, bracelets, medals, seals, figures, bowls and mirrors, all possessing most wonderful virtues. A ring formed of electrum and worn upon the finger will cure lameness, paralysis, and the epilepsy. I have seen a ring of electrum put on the ring or heart finger of a person afflicted with a secret disease. The ring immediately began to sweat and became spotted and even went out of shape with sympathy for the sufferer. Forms, declared the mysteries, possess strange virtues and the tracing of these forms intensifies these virtues and renders them potent ministrants to human ills. The Idean fingers of the Samothracians and other curious effigies of human members were magnetized with medicinal virtues and possessed by a spirit whose strength was sufficient to avert plagues or pestilences and liberate the flesh from all manner of infirmity. Not only was it essential that these devices be made out of the proper substances, but they must be fashioned into definite shapes commodious to the astral light which, flowing through the symbol, was conjured thereby to manifest as a preservative or curative agent. Manipulated by the hierophants the patars who received their wisdom through a keyhole, these models and figures became as though alive. They were charged as with an electric current, at times glowing or radiating showers of sparks and miniature lightning flashes. As forms are the projections of invisible forces, so their artificial construction invokes invisible natures adapted to their geometric patterns. These supermundanes ensoul the objects and lend their power to the magus whose knowledge is sufficient to control them. This explains the strange phenomenon of the talking images, the vocal mechanisms of the ancients, the urns of prophecy and the nature of oracles, for even openings in the earth, apertures in walls and the concavities of vessels, became the abode of genii conformable to those capacities. Moving within their appointed vents and orifices, these spirits caused the phenomenon of winds and strange sounds in sealed amphorae and subterranean crypts. Such forces are too intangible, however, for mortal perception. Unless by secret rituals the genii have been invested with a certain amount of terrestrial substance. 
we shall yet rediscover the secrets of the talking urns that spoke with the voice of ages and through whose lips issued the words of men long dead. By this the ancients did not infer that the dead spoke through these urns, but rather that the words spoken during the lifetime of these men had been preserved in the subtle ethers of cosmos and through specially patterned instruments could be rendered audible again after the lapse of centuries. Science, the necromancy of the twentieth century, will yet accomplish by physical means that which the ancient hierophants performed by their rational knowledge of the inner construction of the universe. Symbols are oracular forms, mysterious patterns creating vortices in the substances of the invisible world. They are centers of a mighty force, figures pregnant with an awful power which, when properly fashioned, loose fiery whirlwinds upon the earth. Pythagoras foretold impending disasters by hydromancy, for he possessed a brazen bowl which, when filled with water, became strangely agitated the surface of the water being continually moved as though a spirit were breathing upon it. Gazing upon the agitated water the Samian sage foretold by the ripples in the water things which were to come. Pythagoras was also one of the veiled philosophers who revealed his instruction from behind a curtain, permitting only certain favored disciples to behold his face. Those desirous of receiving his words were instructed by an intermediary who stood without the door and heard the illumined discourses through the crevices in the locks. Hence the thought of the keyhole philosophers or hierophants who, never beholding the immortals, were the doorkeepers of the Arcanum Arcanorum. Of this order was the Apostle Peter whose name, P.T.R., was the common appellation bestowed upon the instructors in the sacred rites, who were indeed the living rock upon which the house of wisdom was raised. Christianity, as we have it today is a philosophy revealed through a keyhole a few mysterious words caught by an eavesdropper. This illusion, however, has a symbolic rather than a frivolous import. The eavesdropper was a privileged listener permitted to hear that which he could hear, for while he listened without the banquet of the gods was going on within. But only when the divinities shout most lustily do mortals catch even the faintest echo. Symbols are keyholes to doors in the walls of space and through them man peers into eternity. Only to a few, however, is the privilege given to take the gold or silver key of the Kabbalistic light and with it draw back the bolts that hold securely the portals of the Doma Sancti Spiritus. Symbolism, then, is the divine language and its figures are a celestial alphabet by which those upon the seats of the mighty trace their will in the fabric of the worlds. Though the patterns be infinite and man finite, still in the marvelous pageantry of emblems and figures human creatures may behold the workings of their heavenly masters. The meditating seer beholds strange figures in the sky. There are also signs upon the earth as well as in the heavens and he who can read them is lifted up and transported into this sphere of reality. The Buddhist mendicant pays homage to the footprints of his lord, the Egyptians caught upon stone with mallet and chisel the shadows of the gods, and the rational soul gazing out into a universe of images beholds, as it were, a mirage hovering above the expanse of the earth. In this dream world dwell the luminous rishis of the Brahmins' contemplation, here in majestic file pass the mild-faced bodhisattvas in their pilgrimage through eternity. Gazing downward from this mystery above, the symbolist sees faintly shadowed on the plains of earth this passing pageantry of super-mundane things. To the discerning few the outlines of the gods may ever be traced in the flora and fauna of nature. Hovering above terrestrial concerns, the divine orders are sensed by the inner perceptions and rendered knowable by the forms which perpetuate their impulses. It is said that in ancient days God walked in the garden and the light that was with him illumined the parts thereof. Nor is deity today any more distant than yesterday, for the maker of things still blesses his creations with his proximity. The growing grain, the ripening fruit, the tender shoots rising from the dark brown mold, the soft-eyed kind grazing on the hillside, the laughter of men all these bear evidence of the invisible but ever-present Maker. 
God is in his world and although men cannot gaze into his face and live they may gaze upon his works and if they look rightly shall receive life more abundantly. The world is a symbol of the permanence of God, life a symbol of the presence of God and love a symbol of the understanding of God. To those who are able to sense the inner life of things and read into forms even a small part of that great agency which actually ensouls them, the all-sufficiency of universal good is all-sufficing. Symbols are manifested of a mysterious covenant by which the orderliness and consistency of all natures is decreed. Symbols are indeed the peculiar language of a transcendent agent. Men whose ears are unfitted to hear the profundities of the Torah are permitted to behold the law graven upon the battlements of space, flashing from the stars and inscribed upon every leaf and petal. The law thunders from the rocks and in mournful cadence may be heard in the cry of the sea. All symbols are things standing for still greater things, the images of a transcendent perfectness, the witnesses of a sufficient truth, the evangelists of eternity. Thanks for watching the Wisdom Rocker. Don't forget to like, comment and share.